Hi, once again, live and recorded listeners. This is Mark Griffin, Director of Customer Solutions here at Constructs. Uh, as you know, we are a team of software engineering experts led by legendary author Steve McConnell. Here we believe every software team can be more successful at delivering higher levels of business value. In these episodes, we talk with one of our consultants exploring one of our different types of engagements. We describe the issues those engagements were designed to address and how we solve them. So today we're coming to you live again, trying something a little different, letting you see as well as hear us in our little home studios. We are beginning a series of three podcasts that will delve into the world of Kanban, uh, a topic that's pretty popular apparently from the listener feedback we've received on the comments section. We're joined in the virtual studio ether once again by Jenny Stewart, Constructs' VP of Consulting and a frequent Kanban instructor, consultant, and coach. I know this is one of her favorite things to teach, and so I welcome you back to the microphone, Jenny. Thank you. Nice to be here. Awesome. So today's episode is going to focus on something that has come up in many of our client conversations, particularly in terms of problems that teams have in organizing and running their Kanbans. The topic today is five misconceptions about Kanban. And a quick note for for listeners, uh, Jenny has authored a white paper of the same name that um, you can download from Constructs.com website under the Resources tab, just for future reference. So let's start off with a little curious history here on the subject. Kanban, Mm -hmm. even the word has some mystery, right? I mean, Taichi Ono, who uh, people say is the grandfather of lean manufacturing, they put Toyota on the radar screen in the 70s, didn't actually provide a translation for the English word Kanban originally because he didn't want the Western world to know its secret use, which I didn't know. As I was researching this, I found (laughs) that out. It was kind of an interesting thing. The practices Ono put together would be known as the Toyota Production System. That's TPS and not the TPS from Office Space. Uh, Ono was all about eliminating waste. Uh, He used the Japanese word mula in his essence, which is really eliminate waste. Another word he used was jikoda, and that's about the injection of quality in the process. And then there's this word kanban, which referred to the tags that were used as part of just-in-time stock control on the factory floor. So that one in particular, it's not hard to understand how Kanban would have a home in software engineering practice. And you often hear people using the, way, uh, the phrase software factory in, in describing some, uh, some of the things that they build. So Jenny, did I get that mostly right? Is there any other details about the origins you might want to throw out there? A couple things. One is there's a, a really lovely story about some of the ideas of Kanban coming from American style supermarkets and the fact that the shelves were always really nice and full. Um, and the, yes. to keep them full, there were actually indicators in the stores. Like if you took a cereal box, cereal box number one, number two, no big deal. Number three, there'd actually be a little line there. And that line was a signal that you needed to go into the back and bring some stock of the cereal out to the front. Likewise, if you pulled a pallet down for the last cereal boxes that you were taking in front, there'd be another line there indicating as a signal that it was time to actually put an order in for more cereal for the uh, grocery store. So that's part of the the lore of Kanban as well. Um, Interesting. And I just like the idea of it really talking about, you know, it's a, a signal or a signpost or a token uh, that's used as a mechanism for controlling and managing flow of some sort. And the signaling thing is a great, I think that's a great thing, the image to keep in mind. Pretty cool. So let's step into these misconceptions by using the first misconception as maybe a way to define ourselves. Um, The first one is Kanban is only a board. So Jenny, tell us a bit about why this comes up as maybe the most frequent one and maybe that uses that to kind of define things. I'd say this one comes up most frequently because Kanban boards are one of the things that people always think about when they think about Kanban. And so it's easy to say, hey, I have a Kanban board, therefore I am doing all of the ins and outs and details of what Kanban could possibly be. Uh, I joke sometimes that people will literally show me a personal Kanban board, one that has (laughs) a to do in process and done column and tell me they're doing, you know, a really great job of Kanban for, you know, a team of eight people working together, delivering, you know, product backlog items or change requests or enhancements to a system. And I just laugh at that, right? That's a that's a great personal Kanban board, but when it comes to team Kanban, I expect the board to be a lot more uh, illuminating of the kind of work items and workflow that team actually does. Sure. 
Sure. I mean, that makes that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, so what what kind of things would you talk about in terms of like um, really what what the Kanban board is all about for 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 larger than eight people? What sure. kind of things or would, even eight people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or exactly. Three people. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, the big first thing to doing Kanban right is to actually make sure that you really understand the work and the workflow so that when I come by and look at your Kanban board, I can literally get a sense of the kinds of things that a team does. So the Kanban community will talk about uh, visualizing your work and your workflow uh, and talk about things like we need to identify the work item types. What kinds of things do people ask us for? What do we deliver to them? And that's really what's going to flow across our board is something that provides some form of, of value um, to our stakeholders and our users and our consumers. And then I need to understand the steps and stages that work moves through. Uh, for software development, we're often looking at some form of analysis, understanding what it is, uh, then implementation, actually writing code and testing it, and then probably some form of validating that. Um, so that's step number one with Kanban. And that'll often be called shallow Kanban, just visualizing it, but making sure you've really visualized what it really is. Um, and then after that, we can get into some really interesting things that I think makes Kanban uh, sing a lot. And that's the idea of being able to truly limit our work in process. So looking for how many things are on our board and are we producing optimum value throw through that? Or are we just putting a lot of stuff on our board, meaning we're really, really busy, but not a lot of stuff is actually flowing from ideation or beginning work until delivering the value. Uh, another thing I really love about deeper Kanban is the idea of being very explicit about policies. And that can be policies like, what does it mean to be done implementing something? That looks a lot like Scrum's definition of done, um, but it's applied on the board column by column by column or stage by stage by stage. Okay. Um, and then policies about the board itself. Um, just these can be policies about how we prioritize items or how we um, uh, how we agree that we're going to work together or what kinds of things are allowed to even be on our board. So that idea of making policies explicit is actually something I steal a lot from Kanban to use with Scrum teams all the time. And that's a oh, really great okay. thing. Cool. Oh, so really there's a lot more behind the board than just the board, obviously. And that's the, that's the, that's the concept of this first one. Right? There's a lot more to Kanban than just a board. Right. Exactly. So um, the bottom line, you, you mentioned, you know, it's helped this whole process helps uh, improve things collaboratively. You have, everybody has eyes on this thing because it's so visual. It lets you evolve, I guess, changes and make it, make incremental changes as you go. Right? Yep. I mean, yep. I mean, I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, uh, and I think that's certainly evidence of why Kanban and Scrum practices coexist, right? I mean, the idea of continuous improvement, inspect and adapt, right, if you will. Ha ha. <laughs> Self, shameless self-promotion. <laughs> All right, great. So I think that helps frame the other misconceptions as well. So let's talk about misconception number two, which is Kanban is only good for support. Um, sure. And I think that's the notion that, that, that it's perceived primary application is is really for ad hoc work or different streams coming at you and unplanned activities, right? Yep. Well, and I, there's some fairness to this misconception because a lot of the organizations that I work with, we find there are certain categories of teams where Scrum is a really bad fit. So there'll be, you know, we in general as an organization tend to use Scrum except for these areas where Scrum's idea of time boxing, even limiting our time box to one week, doesn't make a lot of sense. So production support teams uh, obviously need something that's way more flexible, right? The phone rings right now, and what I do an hour from now is going to need to fundamentally change, and that's the way the work is all the time. Um, right. So often I'm Help in desk, organiz yeah. organizations where you know Scrum is the preferred, but there are situations where it doesn't make sense to use it. Um, okay. But that doesn't mean that's the only place Kanban can live, right? Just because it's a good fit for those teams doesn't mean that you can't use it for all sorts of other things. Right. One of the, I mean, it, the, it can model anything, right? Yeah, exactly. Really? One of the powers yeah. of Kanban is you can model anything you want. 
So you want to model Scrum? You can model Scrum. You want to model a program flow of work across 10, 15 Scrum teams? You can model that. Um, I have a lot of operations teams that also use Kanban, again, because it's a better fit. And I was actually just on a phone call with an organization where uh, they're standing up their kind of entire software development group. They're doing a re agile reset and all of the teams are all transitioning to Kanban because culturally mm. it's just a better fit for them. Uh, they think it'll work better. They've been doing Scrum for a long time, but not particularly well. And so they wanted something that felt really radically different as a way of saying, hey, we're re-energizing our entire software development effort. And so they're using it across the board on everything. Interesting. So if you're going to model anything, there are certain things you want to make sure you do correctly. And, yes. And so what, what are some of those things you can share with us? The hardest one tends to be getting people to model their work. You know, when I first started all of this, what, six, seven, maybe eight years ago, I can't even remember when I started, um, I always figured the workflow would be the hardest thing to figure out. And surprisingly, that ends up being one of the easiest. The hardest things end up being, what are we actually gonna model and flow through here? And so sitting down and thinking about who asks us for work, what do we actually deliver to them and really thinking about those value pieces tends to be where teams struggle the most. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the, one of the things, um, one of our former colleagues here at Constructs, Melvin uh, Perez, and I did a podcast earlier on in the in the series, and and he mentioned that one of the one of the things that he always saw was people were not being necessarily honest about actually the work they were doing in the course sure. of a given time period. There were things that were, well, I just do that because, you know, it's quick and I do it. <laughs> and then you get layers of snow like that where you have all these things that haven't been exposed as activities. And then you suddenly realize that's why my throughput has taken a dent because I don't really know, I don't have a, a, a bead on all the things that I actually capture. So modeling everything, modeling, um, you know, the current work that's there is an is important part, part of that, correct? Yeah, and making sure that we model what we really do not what we wish we were doing. Right, exactly. I think that's a, that's a good point. So how about things like um, as you go through the process, um, there, there's exit criteria uh, as you flow through this process. What, 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 how, how does that affect the model in, in terms of being real about it? So that, I, I think of that a lot the same way I think about Scrum's definitions of done and definitions of ready. Okay. Um, the stage exit criteria are ways of ensuring that everybody who uses that board understands what it means to consider something to be done, right? Mm -hmm. The difference in Scrum versus Kanban is Scrum's going to think about it really gating a lot about what enters a sprint and what exits a sprint, whereas Kanban's going to think about it stage by stage by stage, uh, but conceptually very similar. We all need to agree on what it means to call something done. Right, right. And then um, because there are, particularly if you're going to focus or talk about, um, you know, support type of things or a lot of streams coming at people asynchronously, there's this, there has to be some notion of class of service, right? That you can have some level of importance that you ascribe to certain kind of things and that, could that wind their way, wind its way into a model as well? It can. I always say you need to use classes of service carefully. Um, okay. You always have the opportunity to prioritize the input queue or the backlog into a Kanban system, and so that ought to be your first line of defense. And if really all you need to do is say, hey, this new thing that just flew in, it needs to go to the top of the list so that it's the next thing we do, you don't need a class of service. Okay. No, because once you start add adding classes of service to a Kanban system, you're going to slow down your standard class of service. Okay. Um, and most commonly I'll see organizations where we really use our standard class of service. Um, that's first in, first out. The next thing at the top of the backlog is the next thing we're going to pull <laughs> in. When I'm looking at the column ahead of me, uh, I'm going to pull in the thing that's kind of the oldest, the aging thing, assuming I can pull everything in, right? If you have got staff specialization, you're going to need to account for that. Um, but standard class of service is, is the first line of defense. And then some groups will need expedite. And expedite, I describe as hair on fire. 
<laughs> Watch that now. <laughs> Uh, but the problem is, once you have an expedite class of service, well, who wants to use expedite classes of service? Okay. Everybody, so right? Right. And right. if you expedite everything, then you... You're back to the same point again. You're back to standard class of service. So here's where things like board level policies, what's allowed to be expedited, become really important. Um, generally, when I stand up a team that has an expedite lane, we will agree that we should only be expediting one thing at a time. Right? Um, and we'll put very clear policies around what's allowed to go into the expedite lane. And those can actually be kind of funny. I had a team once who was doing production support and they said, well, expedite is anything that's a, a customer service level agreement and SLA related priority one, severity one defect goes in the expedite lane or because hi muckety muck so-and-so came down and yelled at us and told, we, told us we had to do it. <laughs> It's a funny motivator sometimes. The so, guy that writes your check, yep. you know, how surprising that is. Yep, but their policy <laughs> was it was a P1S1 SLA-related defect or, you know, Joe Schmo senior executive told us we had to do it. We That's what we wrote down because that's the way it was. Um, oh, the hand of God. Yep, mm, yep. Something like that. So usually the most common class of service I'll see is a team that has standard and expedite. Every once in a while, I'll set up teams and boards that have more complicated sets of classes of service. But again, I, I kind of have to get talked into having a class of service on a board. I treat that pretty... Um, advanced topic kind of thing? Or yeah, not just advanced, advanced methods. but do we really have to have that, right? Convince okay. me that we really need to have it. And if you can, we'll totally do it. But if we can just prioritize the backlog or the input queue, and that's enough, it's it's easier, and it also keeps that standard class of service moving uh, as quickly as it possibly can. That's a good point. So, so you know, you put this in play in, in a new organization, and then you, I guess, you kind of want to instrument it, right? You want to be able to see how it's working. You, you want to yep. pull off metrics, and then what what are some natural feedback loops you want to do for that? Just measure. What are you measuring? What kind of things do you do? In that process. The most common things that people running Kanban systems look at are cycle time, and that's okay. the time from which something is pulled off the backlog or input queue to the time that it goes into the done column. So it's our time in work time, basically. Okay. Um, and then some teams will also have lead time. And lead time is cycle time plus whatever time it sat in the backlog waiting to get pulled into the Kanban system. So it's queue wait time plus cycle time for lead time. Okay. Uh, and and all, the, sorry, go ahead, Mark. Go ahead. No, that's all right. Go ahead. I was going to say, all the tools will give you average cycle time, but what's actually really interesting isn't the average. It's the distribution of the cycle time. You know, how many times was it five days versus six days versus 20 days versus 40 days? What's that distribution look like? And that will really tell you whether you've got a predictable system or not. Or even, you know, even when you look at that, if you see peaks at different points yep. that would maybe identify, would that be a potential way to say, okay, maybe we do need to have an exploit lane because we're seeing a frequency of this particular thing that, has a higher business value that we need to get on top of is that would that be a reasonable thing to think about or maybe not i wouldn't do that for cycle time right because that okay. cycle time doesn't tell me whether something was urgent or not right an, an expedite is really this can't wait it has right. to interrupt it's so much more important than our other work that mark i need you to drop the phone and go do this right now right right okay. that's the kind of thing that i'm looking for on whether or not you need an expedite lane if I do see um, big um, peaks, multiple peaks in cycle time, what that tells me is the system has a wide variation of size in it. So if I had three peaks, there's probably one peak around the stuff in our system that's really small, the stuff in mm -hmm. our system that's kind of mid-size, and the stuff in our system that's really big. Um, and so at that point, one of the things to get consistency in a Kanban system is to try and make sure that you don't have incredible diversity in the size of work items that are flowing through the system. Mm 
So I'll need to do something to address that. And the two most common things that you can do is either separate that into swim lanes in your Kanban board. So we'd have small work, medium work, and large work flowing through three different lanes in our board. Or to start putting some rationale around size. So you might do something there like when you have your input queue, in order to enter the system, it has to be a medium t-shirt size or smaller. Okay. Um, in analysis, maybe there's another form of uh, estimation we do there in our first stage of understanding the work to make sure that it's, you know, again, maybe a t-shirt size of small or smaller, or we, maybe there we go into story pointing, but some activities that help us bring some consistency. It's not something that's a huge concern for the manufacturing Kanbans. Right? You weren't going to turn to your bolts and suddenly right. have a giant bolt and a tiny bolt. <laughs> or we'll use three out of five on the tire. It'll be okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But in Oops. software or in, you know, firmware or hardware, a, a knowledge work, in knowledge work Kanban system, size consistency does become a really important consideration to think right. through. Right. I mean, in... In, in a pure scrum environment, you, you certainly have to look at that as sizing and, and decomposition and making sure that things that enter a sprint are sized appropriately for the team to consume in that period of time. You talk about swim lanes with the, with the various sizes, of bigger, you know, would you ever decompose some of those and, and move them from one swim lane to another, potentially? Or is that, I, is that not a visual? That yeah, makes I, sense? I doubt I would be doing that. I mean, my most common thing that I like to do is actually try and not have three different lanes for small, medium, and large, is to take those really large things and move them into smaller units of work, right? So gotcha, gotcha. Okay. There's no reason that just like other agile implementations we can't have a concept of a requirements hierarchy where we have you know features have epics have stories or epics have features have stories um and so what we're saying is you know what really flows across a team's board is going to be stories or smaller product backlog items and then i'm also going to look at the flow of epics across maybe multiple teams so that kind of conversation and consideration becomes true um when you're combining Kanban with Scrum, or also if you're just trying to understand the flow across many Kanban teams. Okay, well, that makes a lot of sense. I'll mention here that there are additional resources on our website um, that address implementation guidance, which, um, by the way, we'll also cover in the next podcast that everybody should listen into uh, of this series. And there's also some example boards that are viewable there. So let's, uh, let's move on to misconception number three, and that one is Kanban is only good for small teams. And I know how much you love sports analogies, so lobbing <laughs> you another softball here, Jenny. Hit the softball. <laughs> well, again, a misconception, I think, has some rooting in truth in that, you know, for really small teams, you look at the Scrum Guide, and the Scrum Guide says, you know, three to nine people on a dev team, plus a product owner, plus a Scrum Master, um, so, you know, if you're two people and especially two people who, well, before COVID hit, sat together. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Virtually sat together. I don't think you need all the, the structure of something like Scrum, right? For a team of right. two or three people, I'm probably going to turn to Kanban a lot more than I am for Scrum. So, again, I think there's um, there's some... I will often give people guidance, right? If Scrum's the primary method, we'll have sort of selection criteria by which we'll choose when we should use Kanban instead because it's a better fit and situations like it's a really small team, I will go there. But just like we talked about before, it's not the only time that I'll use it. And there's nothing that stands in our way of, you know, having a hundred person organization who's using Kanban for individual teams with a program Kanban lay over top of that to develop and build product or systems or software. Oh, well, that makes sense. I mean, how about some other examples of some larger implementations? What kind of things you, would you normally see out there or recommend with people? Uh, maybe give me a little bit more clarity in your question. So like something like, you know, you mentioned, you just alluded to the sort of a, a portfolio or program level implementation, right? You could have multiple tiers of 
of implementation perhaps or maybe cascading levels yeah yep right something like that so what, what tell me about those yeah actually the group i was just talking to before we started this podcast is is doing exactly that we're setting up uh, program level Kanban boards that are looking more at the flow of epics through their whole organization uh, mm. and they're defining epics to be things like um, new product releases major major new initiatives or new enhancements to the system uh, and so, so really big things right? really big things and things yeah, yeah. that may only go to one team or may need two or three or more teams in the organization to deliver end user value. And so we're modeling what the flow looks like there and putting some structure around what it what an epic means for this organization. And then each individual team then has a view of the individual product backlog items that are flowing across their board that aggregate up into that meaningful value that flows across the portfolio of work that the entire organization is doing. Right. So one of the things that, that I think about with all of this is that this is a very visual way of, of, of looking at work. And so s many teams have physical boards where you, you actually have them somewhere in a facility. <laughs> Not as but, much right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, here's a picture of my wall. Move that thing over. Um, true. Um, but but I, just in terms of, of as you get into this hierarchy of things, you, you're you're certainly talking about tools, right? Yeah. That, that that can actually display this, and so, but you you also have, want those tools to be visible to anybody who wants information from the system, right? So even executives can actually look at something and maybe see something going on, yep. perhaps. Okay. Yeah, and that's why usually the team, an individual on a on one team using Kanban, wants a view of the work that we're doing together day in and day out. Right. But the leaders, the VP engineering, VP product, senior management wants to look at a higher level of abstraction at mm -hmm. the feature or epic level, the larger pieces of value that are flowing there, which is why, honestly, regardless of whether it's Scrum or Kanban at the team level, I'm always working with leaders and organizations to put Kanban in at the program level above multiple teams so that I can see that flow of value flowing across a large group of teams. Um, and I think Kanban really sings there. It's one of the things I'm constantly advocating. Yeah, so so in that case, it's radiator. It's a radiator to those higher level people who can, who can you know, get the level of abstraction they need, yep. as opposed to digging in very deeply at some, at some you know, granularity that does, is not important for them. They're looking more at, Please don't surprise me. Yeah. <laughs> Those kinds of questions, right? I mean, well, and hopefully they're also starting to think about work in progress, right? How much do we have? If if I think of my, how many features are we currently implementing or how many epics are we currently implementing? And I'm halfway through a six month release. Hopefully I don't have, you know, uh, of the 60 that we plan to do, two are done, 45 are in progress, and, you know, two are in analysis. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right. Well, I think that that's a good segue into misconception number four, um, you know, the utilization or planning aspect of this, right? Kanban, the misconception number four is Kanban can support long-range planning. Yep. And, and, and it probably comes from most people's understanding of this being uh, oriented towards production line support. So people, people maybe think about it only in that context, but there are other ways you can use it, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the first key will be to make sure that you are starting to get some reasonable consistency or predictability in the Kanban system. So I always tell people that, you know, first step is to make sure that you're looking at cycle time distribution data and seeing that that's um, pretty reasonably stable, right? If you if you map that data and it's all over the map, then that that team um, still has some work just to make things a little bit more consistent and predictable. It's going to be hard to guarantee any outcome. Uh, by the way, sometimes we see that on Scrum teams too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've heard. <laughs> Um, so, you know, first thing is to 
again, whether it's Scrum or Kanban, get some reasonable um, predictability in my data delivery, my cycle time mm -hmm. or my mm -hmm. velocity data. And then from there, I can start to use some throughput metrics to kind of forecast what I think is going to take to, to deliver work, right? Right. That makes sense. I mean, and, and I think you mentioned before on this that the is the key in this process is to try and use items that are about the same size. That's so right. you, can, you have some kind of normalizing going on. Yep. Right? Yeah, I mean, you'll see if you've got a system that has, you know, 15% is huge, 80% is medium, or 70% is medium, and the rest is really small. When you graph out your cycle time data there, you're going to see that that system's pretty unpredictable. Just because of the spread. Just because right. of the spread of size. Yeah, interesting. Um, so, but you you still have issues even in 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 planning and predictability with, I guess for lack of a better word, cue busters, right? Things that 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 come in, and, and but I really I think that's all part of any normal discipline of a team. Sure. Right? Their behavior. They have to be careful what what to do in that situation. That's part yeah, back to your sort of, you know, setting up your your criteria, you know, your exit criteria, things of that nature. Yeah, and a couple things there, right? One, when you ch chart out cycle time distribution, you almost always see a pretty long tail on that. And so most people, when they set like a service level agreement for Kanban system, will set that at the 85th percentile. So they'll say something like, you know, this system will deliver in 21 days or less 85% of the time. And a lot of the delivery happens in more like 10, 11, 12, 14 days, right? It happens significantly further on the or less side. Right. Um, but there'll okay. be that long tail of the occasional thing that gets stuck in the system for some reason. Uh, and so you will see that in the graphs that get produced and shared by Kanban teams. Um, sometimes it's not a long skinny tail, it's a really, really thick tail, uh, <laughs> or it's a really weird curve in the middle or some other weird skew. And so that tells us that we want to do some analysis on the kinds of things that block in our system and understanding mm -hmm. them and seeing what we can do to improve our system. Um, one small example there is I had a group I was working with once who certain kinds of work that entered their system required that they made an ask to their organizational IT department. And the average time to get a, a, a response and get what they needed for them to deliver their work was four weeks. Wow. Uh, so you can imagine their first stage was planning. So if they move something into planning and then realize they had to make the ask, it gets stuck there for four weeks. And so wow. what we did was we said, okay, every time you review your input queue, you're going to go down about four weeks ahead of you, right? So I think we said once a week. Once a week, you'll go down four weeks ahead of you, and you'll look for any work items that are coming up the queue that have that kind of work in them where you'd need to make the ask, and you'll make the ask now. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and now every once in a while, they'd make an ask, and that thing didn't end up coming into the system, um, but it helps them get rid of the vast majority of things that ended up blocking for about four weeks with a little bit of extra work waste right for the things right. where they did the request and then ended up not doing that particular work item makes sense what about uh um the idea of uh, again we mentioned that that executives kind of use these things to track and not be surprised at, would is it at all realistic to think that someone might peer into that and and realize that that the amount of work getting through a, a particular time is just not enough for the needs of the business and so does that inform perhaps an executive to say we're understaffed on, on in a particular area is that is, are those kind of things that might arise from the, someone staring at it at a high level kanban board it might, but we all know some of the pitfalls that can come from trying to say something like, hey, this team ought to have twice as much throughput, so here, let me double your staff capacity. Right. <laughs> is, it the same, is that the same sensitivity that you have with an Agile team in terms of like throwing more bodies at a problem is the wrong thing to do? It's exactly the same sensitivity as any team, right? Um, 
you know, you can literally see this when you do it to scrum teams where their velocity will slow down before it speeds up. Mm -hmm. um, and you can say the same thing in Kanban teams, right? If you yank off a person for another team that's working on a more important project, or if you're late and so we dump twice as many people on you, you're going to see that team slow down before it speeds up. So, I mean, certainly there's nothing wrong with uh, strategically changing team staffing over time, right? Mm -hmm. This particular area of the business is becoming more important. Um, but one of my, I have two quotes that I use all the time with Kanban groups and actually often with scrum teams as well. And one of them is we want to move the work to the people not mm -hmm. the people to the work. Right. That's a classic. Yep. So um, I just, I would think maybe, and I keep going back to, to, to this just to, just because it's, I'm just in, in my head thinking about applications for this, but you, you can conceivably have a particular niche expert. Sure. And maybe that person starts seeing a pile up at, at their inbox that, that as they start seeing stuff come into the system they can't get to it enough that would, might be a red flag for resourcing or, or, or maybe growing capability yeah. within the organization right yeah and I see that again regardless of agile methodology chosen <clears throat> um, I see staff specialization as an issue for a lot of teams and team over team over team we end up just sitting down together and talking about their unique situation and their unique work. And the most common thing I'll do with groups is we'll establish a working agreement to help them share that uh, specialization more broadly. Um, so just one example of a group I worked with once had, they had three backend engineers and one front-end engineer, uh, I think a half a tech writer and a couple test engineers on their team. Mm -hmm. And they'd been struggling really hard because their backlog was full of work that was about 50-50 front-end, back-end, and obviously they were back-end heavy. <laughs> right, right. So where's the, where's the delay? Oh, yeah, man. and, you know, so the natural question for me is things like, well, is this temporary? Is this just a short moment in time, or is this your future? And sure enough, it was their future. So they ended up with a working agreement. Um, where the back-end engineers would w rotate in to work on front-end stuff. Hmm. Um, and so they, I mean, I didn't tell them to do it, right? You tell people to do things like that, it's not going to go well. They decide themselves as a team that this is a good thing for them to do to become more capable and more cross-functional over time. A uh, whole different story. Um, right. I mean, when you're talking about pure scrum, you, you have these periods of time when you finish sprints where the team goes into this retrospective. In in the case of, of Kanban, it's isn't it more sort of continuous? So where does the team, does the team continuously think about that? Or are there particular appropriate breakpoints where the team might say, we need to change the way we're doing things? Yeah. The goal is that you would be even more continuously learning than you are in Scrum, right? Because Kanban okay. has no time boxes. So there's no right. moment in time where we're quote, ending a sprint and reflecting on that sprint. Instead, we're continuously thinking about our system and our work. Uh, that said, young teams typically have a hard time doing that. So when I introduce Kanban into teams, I will typically say, if we haven't done an experiment on our system in the last two weeks, it's time to do a Scrum style retrospective. Oh, interesting. And okay. so we'll steal from Scrum. Now, if you've come up with something and you're experimenting already, then we don't need to hold that, right? So encouragement, to experiment more frequently, but recognition that you can get so busy doing your work in Kanban that you won't be doing that ongoing continuous improvement that's really part of deep Kanban. When people get to really deep Kanban, uh, the teams are continuously experimenting using data and models and hypotheses about what to do. I, but I don't find teams start there. Right. Right. Well, that's fun, though. It sounds like it's an evolutionary thing that people like to like to tinker. And, and I think it's uh, 
I think engineers in general like to have efficiency in whatever they do. So yep. that's a natural trait to kind of go back and dig. <laughs> right? I always used Absolutely. to uh, joke about a lot of the engineers that I knew that if they did it once, they'd do it. If they did it twice, they'd automate it. Yes, exactly right. <laughs> exactly. I'm going to stop and do this. So now we get to the final misconception number five, and that is Kanban or Scrum is an either or decision. And that maybe that's one of maybe your favorite one to debunk, right? It, you like to it is. Go at that one. <laughs> so how about some examples of, of uh, uh, to illustrate that one that you might want to share with us? So I always tell people it's not a question of whether Scrum or Kanban. It's a question of where in your organization is Kanban going to make sense? Um, I work with a lot of teams where the vast majority or a lot of organizations where the vast majority of their product development or system development teams are running Scrum. Mm -hmm. But then we apply Kanban in specific areas, operations teams, production support teams, teams where we want them to be much more responsive than even a one week sprint cycle allows. Um, like for example, the automation tooling team, right? The okay. team who isn't doing the automation, but they're providing the infrastructure that supports the scrum teams to do automation. I want them to be able to do work where they can deliver within a couple days to support the scrum teams within that sprint. Um, so we'll have places where there's groupings of scrum teams and there's select Kanban in a few places and again, let's say this is 25 teams working together, I'm gonna to come in and, and do a program Kanban over the top of all of these. Okay. So is that um, sort of, I mean, the teams can actually, can actually also model the workflow they're doing in Scrum sure. using a Kanban, sure. right? However, Scrum comes with a lot, right? It comes, I, I always joke that um, Scrum is a bit of a, a cookbook Right? You can go download the Scrum Guide and here are your three roles and your five events and your two artifacts and you'll get a pretty tasty dish out of it. You might want to add a little cumin or a little cayenne, but it comes <laughs> with a lot of stuff. And so I don't want to try and take a team who isn't doing Scrum well or is new to Scrum and say, oh, well, you're at it. Also do all this Kanban stuff because it's just too much. Overwhelming. It's overwhelming. Yeah. So right. I always tell Scrum teams, if you choose Scrum, do Scrum well, get really good at it. And that's usually going to take at least a year, maybe a couple years before they're a pretty mature, high functioning team. Uh, don't try and use Kanban to fix bad Scrum. Fix bad Scrum. <laughs> bad, bad Scrum. <laughs> I've seen a lot of bad scrum in my time. Yeah, it keeps <laughs> us in business, actually. But yeah, that's correct. Um, so that's my approach if you're in, going the scrum route. Now, if you're going the Kanban route, pure Kanban, and I'm standing up a pure Kanban team, then we can steal willy-nilly from scrum all we want. Because okay. Kanban doesn't come with a recipe. You have to build your own recipe from scratch. It's not okay. rocket science to do it, but you do have to do all the thinking. You need to think about my work and my workflow and whip limits and stage exit criteria and board criteria and how are we going to prioritize our input queue. Those are all decisions that you need to make in adopting Kanban. And so if there's things out of Scrum, like if you already have product owners in your organization or on that team, let's keep them. Um, if you like retrospectives, yeah, great. Let's say, hey, our agreement is if we haven't had a continuous process improvement idea since two weeks ago, we're going to have one of those. Um, so that's that's kind of, I, I really think about the adoptions as being quite different in terms of when I would bring Scrum Bond into right, the conversation. Right, right. But you, I mean, I think I think you like to say that teams are always empowered to choose, right? At some point in time, as they analyze the work and as like analyze things that they're doing, they have an opportunity to to make that distinction on their own or make that change on their own. Um, you know, it's very organizationally sensitive. I think a lot okay. of places that I go into, there's a tendency towards Scrum. Okay. Um, and. So if the organization in general wants teams doing Scrum, um, then I'm going to bias that direction. Um, okay. 
Now, every once in a while, I will do some sneaky things. Like I had an organization <laughs> once that everybody was doing Scrum, and then they had me sit down with all the key architects of the system. Uh, and the senior architect told me, I can't be a product owner. I don't have time. I have too much other stuff. And I said, well, how about we make your team look like it's Scrum, but we'll set you up using Kanban. <laughs> So they were able to report velocity and they were able to tell people what their sprint commitments were, but under the covers, it, it was actually Kanban. Um, I did go tell their SVP I'd done it after the fact, so I didn't feel too bad. Um, <laughs> and that was well received, I assume. It was. He's right. like, those are yeah. all my senior guys. I just wanted you to make them happy. Good. Um, so, you know, sometimes I'll do that, but I do think a, a lot of places the organization has a bias in one direction. If it's towards Scrum, I will respect that, but I will tell them, let's at least put selection criteria in place that allow people to know when Kanban is the better choice for you in this organizational context. And that's the, that's the evidence-based decision making that you like, right? That you you they they see something that actually strongly suggests you go that direction. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that makes sense. Because I do think, I mean, one of the pitfalls I see a lot in Kanban is that people don't understand what really good Kanban looks like, and so they look at all the rigor and the discipline of Scrum, and they say, "I don't like that. I'm going to do Kanban instead." And so they slap a veneer on top of bad practice and call it Kanban. And then that gives the organization kind of a bad taste in its mouth about Kanban. So that's, mm -hmm. I have seen that before and that is just not a pattern I enjoy. Yeah, I, mean, I can see how that would be. Yeah, and, and, and I think that the, the right decisions make sense when people do them. I mean, you like to introduce Kanban quite a bit in a lot of the, the training that you do, yep. for sure. Almost um, always. <laughs> Any, any, uh, I think we're getting up towards the top of the hour. So any parting words on this topic you want to share as we close, close out this discussion? Um, I guess the main thing I'd like people to know is that there's a lot more richness and nuance to Kanban than most people think. Uh, back to that Kanban is just a board. I do think because Kanban boards have become so predominant and because a lot of the tools have Kanban boards in them, um, people really do kind of stop there and they leave what is truly the power of Kanban on the table by just continuing to think that's the only part of Kanban that exists and not talking about whip limits and not talking about policies and not talking about this idea of let's evolve faster than scrum teams. Yeah, well, that, that that's a great, I think that's a great way to kind of close out today. Um, and we'll take more, like I said, we have two more episodes we're going to do on this. The next one we're going to talk about is more the nuts and bolts of, of actually how to set up a Kanban system. But thanks again, Jenny, today for coming here and talking about these five misconceptions with us. Um, I'm actually excited to have you back for the next episode. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Awesome, awesome. Uh, and thank you, Zoom listeners, as well, that have been uh, listening to us in the background here live this time. Be sure to tune in again for another episode of uh, Inspect and Adapt, the Constructs podcast. Until then, this has been Mark Griffin as your host. Liz Ostaszewski has been our audio engineer, and Devin Musgrave is our fearless producer. If you enjoyed this podcast, feel free to give us a positive rating on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, or wherever you normally find us. As I mentioned earlier, the nexus of this Kanban series came from you, our listeners, so it does indeed work. We do listen to you. And so if you have ideas for a future podcast or comments on this one, or you'd like to talk to one of our practitioners about this or other topics, reach out via, using, via email using comments at constructs.com. Again, that's comments at constructs.com. We'd love to hear from you. Keep staying safe, everybody out there. We're all starting to loosen up things, but, you know, keep a handle on the distancing and the masking and all that kind of stuff. Have a great next week.